Good evening. Is it started yet? Good evening. Um, sorry about that. We've had uh, a t couple of uh, technical difficulties, <laughs> but hopefully we'll uh, be on our way now. Um, we'll give it um, another second or so, um, and then we will start the um, webinar off. Okay, right, we're um, gonna, going to uh, make a start now. So, um, good evening all. Um, we hope you're all well and keeping safe, um, especially at the moment. Um, thank you for joining us. My name's Emily and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Officer for the Skills Development um, in the PORC team. I'll be facilitating this evening's meeting. So, we're going to be looking into farrowing from a small scale producer um, perspective um, and then we're going to have an update from the VPA to follow. So we've got some um, just just a couple of housekeeping um, points to start. So um, all of the participants um, are on mute and you're unable to communicate verbally um, onto this webinar. Um, today's session is running for an hour and a half um, max so we're starting at seven and um, looking to end at the very latest of 8.15. The webinar session is being recorded, um, so if you've if you've joined us now, then you will receive a link um, in a follow-up email that will be with you 24 to 48 hours after we've finished, um, and will also be available on various online platforms, um, such as our website um, and the BPA website. Um, so please don't worry about taking too many notes, etc. For those of you who are signed up with our online training record, um, Pig Pro, you are able to log your attendance on there. And then we will be taking any questions after speakers have finished their slots. Um, so at the, they have got um, some time at the end of there and we've allocated 10 minutes at the end that I can um, pop, pop the questions to the speakers um, that have come through afterwards. So how to ask a question. This is um, in regards if you're on a laptop. So um, step one, you've got your um, control panel there. Click the orange box um, and it will bring out on the what, what you can see on the right there. If you click into questions, type your question in there and pop the send and it will come through to me. Um, so on a phone, there is a question mark button which will um, act to do exactly the same and send those questions over to me. You won't be able to see, um, the other attendees won't be able to see your questions and I it will keep it um, sort of anonymous. Um, so yes. Um, so if you um, didn't join us early and see the introduction slides, um, this is the team that we have today. Um, so we've got Adrian Cox um, from Farm Vet, Marcus Bates from the BPA, and there's myself as well. So first up is Adrian, um, and I'll I'll give you a second to introduce yourself. Um, so over to you. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you all very much for logging on this evening. And I hope during these strange periods you find yourself well. As the entry bio suggested, I'm a vet that just deals with uh, pigs and uh, have qualified in 92 and have just worked in the pig industry for the last 25 years. So um, that's, that's me in a nutshell. I advise breeding company and large producers around the country. So my opening slide, um, even the least observant of you are likely to have noticed that this isn't a slide with pigs on, but rather 
uh, black cattle, specifically Aberdeen Angus cattle. So these are uh, my own cattle taken a couple of years ago from, from one of the fields. And really, I just put it up to uh, demonstrate that uh, I share your livestock keeping tendencies and hopefully have the same highs that you guys have keeping your livestock and probably have the same exasperations with them as well on occasions. So I have the next slide, please. So today's topic that I've been asked to discuss is uh, farrowing. And as you'll all be aware, uh, the farrowing is the process by which a gilt or sow, gilt being a, a young female that's not farrowed previously, gives birth to her piglets. And here's just a photo of a commercial pig. Um, sorry, all of my pictures are of commercial pigs because I haven't got any of the uh, uh, sort of small scale production on this particular topic. Uh, and you can see that she's given birth to a raft of piglets already. A couple have made their way round to the other line and are looking for or starting to suckle. A couple suckling behind her leg at the wrong area and another one dropped out behind her. And you can, if you look carefully, you can see that two of them at least are still attached by their umbilical cord tracking from the piglet into the inside of the sow. Next slide, please. So within the time frame that I've been allocated, I'll try and cover a raft of topics today. Um, and as a change from farrowing, right at the end, I've been asked to give a little chat on African swine fever. But this will be fairly uh, quick, because I know Marcus is going to cover it in a lot more detail. But as Emily said at the start, if you've got any questions on what I'm talking about, feel free to send them in. Next slide, please. So first thing is to just set a, a few um, basics, questions that I typically get asked and uh, things that I'm hoping that you probably all know the answers to anyway. So what age should a guilt be served at for the first time? So commercially, we would tend to serve guilts at 210 to 240 days, about seven to eight months. And from having given this talk previously with real audiences rather than virtually online, the feedback I've got is that the uh, producers like yourselves tend to make their guilds anything from eight to 12 months of age. Problem I have with that latter age is it's probably just a bit too old for my liking. Animal can get a bit overfit, get a bit large, and that might reduce her uh, reproductive efficiency and maybe increase the risk of farrowing problems later on, particularly possibly as she ages. How long is a sow pregnant? Probably all know the answer to that, three months, three weeks, three days. So around 115, 117 days. How long does the farrowing process last? That can be very variable. It can be two to three hours or with uh, some farrowings, it can go on a lot longer than that, maybe eight, eight hours plus. Certainly I've had instances where sows have commenced farrowing on one day, appear to have gone to sleep, and then lo and behold, another couple of piglets have been popped out the following morning quite unexpectedly. So things can happen. How often is a piglet born? Well, if you avoid the oddities of the above comment about overnight farrowing, then generally uh, the first and second piglet, um, there's quite a longer interval between those being born than piglets thereafter. So maybe 45 minutes to an hour between the first couple of piglets, thereafter probably every 25 to 30 minutes. Certainly there's been a lot of research which has shown that um, a live-born piglet tends to uh, drop out the back of the sow every 17 minutes or so, and that if the uh, time is increased to 25 minutes between piglets, then that piglet is more likely to be born as a stillbirth rather than a live-born. So that might be something that you need to consider if you're monitoring farrowing and looking to decide whether your sow needs assistance. 
How many piglets does she have? That will certainly vary between lines, between breeds and within the breed. So some of the breeds perhaps have a tendency for smaller litters, uh, possibly breeds like the Tamworth. Um, some have a tendency to much larger litters like British Lop. And commercially, it would be uh, not unusual now to see litters in excess of 20 piglets being born to odd individual sows, which whilst excellent, obviously brings its own challenges with respect to getting those piglets through to weaning. So how old should piglets be before they're weaned? I would suggest about four weeks onwards. So piglets, uh, the older they are before they're weaned, generally the more mature they are, the better their gut architecture has developed, particularly if they've had some creep feed or stolen some of mum's feed prior to weaning. And hopefully that means that the transition of being weaned is a smoother process with little concern. And lastly, I often get asked how quickly a sow can be reserved once she's had her litter. So again, if you think of weaning at four weeks, for example, she'll uh, come back onto heat within the week after she's been weaned and would be ready to serve at that time. It takes about three, three and a half weeks for the uterus to go from its flabby state having dropped all the piglets to the non-pregnant state ready to receive a pregnancy. So typically four weeks onwards. Next slide, please. So one of the key issues is to make sure that when you're farrowing your, your cells down, that you've got some decent accommodation for them. And what makes good accommodation, obviously? Um, to my mind, it should be able to be cleaned and disinfected between farrowing so that the piglets are being born into as clean an environment as is possible to reduce the risk of cross infection and disease between uh, litters. It should be safe and comfortable. So that's safe for the sow so that she doesn't feel agitated and can happily continue with the process of farrowing. Comfortable so that she's not um, getting up and down because there's a stone sticking into her underside or something silly like that but also it needs to be safe for yourselves. So if you need to keep an eye on the sow or you need to interfere, intervene, then it's important that you can do that safely. And even the most docile sow, um, if she's just farrowed or in the process of farrowing and you disturb her, her attitude can change and it's always useful to have an exit route planned just in case. The accommodation should be draft free. That's very important, particularly in colder weather. Um, piglets are born with very little brown fat, which is the insulatory tissue that keeps newborns warm and prevents them from chilling. And because they're born with such little amounts of fat, they can chill very, very quickly. And air movement at pig level, drafts at pig level, can certainly increase that chilling and a chilled piglet is more likely to lie next to mum with the risk of being squashed or possibly uh, suffer health issues such as scouring. Obviously, you need to be able to observe the farrowing in an ideal world. And we've just said about good bedding in order to the sounds comfortable. And I tend to like the idea of sounds farrowing down on a straw bed of two or three inches uh, depth, nice and flat such that um, sows comfortable but piglets don't get entangled in lots of deep straw where they can actually get lost and or overlain. Next slide please. So farrowing accommodation can differ uh, and some of you may use conventional or commercial farrowing arcs some may use horse stables or you've made your own type of accommodation but these are just a couple of pictures of commercially available firing arcs so the uh, top right arc which looks a bit like an igloo is a plastic arc called an aardvark and they've got they're completely round so there are no corners for piglets to get trapped into and stuck 
Um, they're nicely insulated and light to manoeuvre. The arc below it is a typical half moon arc that's very commonly used. Again, piglets can get out the way of drafts there by tucking into the corners. And then you've got potentially wooden arcs with either a pent type roof or an A-frame roof. And wood is good because it doesn't tend to heat up as much in the summer months. Next slide, please. So this is a set of pictures taken by a colleague of mine using an infrared camera. So it picks up heat sources. And you can see from the top left picture that you can make out the outline of a little piglet and that's stood in a fender, which is um, a metal enclosure just outside the arc to retain the piglets from jumping out and running away whilst they're too young. Um, so that piglet's nice and bright and shows that it's warm and presumably from that we can infer that it's well fed and is, is doing well. Picture to the right, again, internal temperature of the arc. You can see that you've got three or four piglets there, again, bright and happy. The recording is saying 25 degrees, so nice internal arc temperature. And then that black square in the back of it is, I think, a viewing window uh, showing that the outside is much cooler. And then the bottom uh, slide picture is uh, showing a dark outline of an arc with heat all around it. And that's tending to show the benefit of the insulated arc on a summer's day where you've not got a lot of heat coming out, but similarly, it's not letting a lot of heat into that arc. So you've got a good internal environment there for the piglets. Next slide, please. So many of you are likely to have had bitches that maybe have had puppies and um, you may well have tried taking the bitch's temperature before she's whelped, knowing that her temperature will drop as she gets closer to whelping. And perhaps that's something that we can do with sows and gilts to see if that gives us a better indication of when they'll farrow. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how keen you are to go to your sow and stick a thermometer into them, that's not a useful way to determine whether a sow will farrow. It doesn't actually work with sows. Next slide, please. Signs that are more indicative of um, farrowing behaviour happening very shortly. Um, nesting behaviour, the sow will typically walk around, collect nesting material, straw within her mouth and go and make a bed for herself. And certainly the ability to show this natural behaviour and make her own bed is certainly conducive with speedier farrowing process and overall a better outcome. She'll be restless, so mooching about, uh, exploring where to farrow down, looking at several sites possibly to make a nest. The important thing though is she may be restless before farrowing, but you want to make sure that she isn't restless during the farrowing process, as this could be an indicator of a problem that may or may not need assistance. Um, typically, sows will show reduced appetite immediately prior to farrowing, maybe for the 48 hour, 24 hour period prior to farrowing. And we can use that to our advantage by feeding the sow slightly less at this period and immediately post farrowing. And this can help to reduce some farrowing issues whereby if sows have a full gut of food uh, immediately prior to farrowing, they're more likely to have farrowing difficulties. And similarly, if they're overfed either side of farrowing, they're more likely to perhaps develop problems such as mastitis, particularly for the farrowing in a field with lots of grass access. That seems to be another potential trigger factor. The presence of milk on the teat lines is a very good indicator that they'll farrow within the day, normally within 12 hours if there's milk present, and that is probably the most reliable, consistent indicator that we would go with. And then lastly, literally, when the sow has started the process of farrowing, just before she drops her piglet, she's likely to lift her hind leg up towards her abdomen and her tail twitches slightly and hopefully a piglet drops out.
Next slide, please. So this is a, a short video showing a sow in the process of giving birth. You can see she's had three piglets already, um, labeled one, three, and four. I'm not sure where number two has gone to, but you can see that she's pushing away, um, trying to farrow there. And actually that's something to be careful about. Unlike um, cows or sheep or humans for that matter, um, sows should show very little effort when they're actually farrowing down. Um, we'll probably be used to seeing sheep and cattle uh, produce young and it's all about the abdomen straining and there's a lot of vocalization. With sows, the uterus is very muscular and that does the majority of the work in pushing piglets out. So there's very little abdominal straining as a general rule. And if you do see sows really struggling, that again is an indicator that there may be an issue that needs a little bit of intervention. Next slide, please. So we'll show you two videos of um, sows farrowing down. These are both excellent, but for different reasons. Thus far, I've been lucky enough and nobody has uh, admitted to putting these videos on YouTube, and I trust my luck holds out for today. But you'll see this first video, and to me, this is a perfect video of what not to do. So in a normal presentation, we'd go around the room picking up faults, but to highlight it here, you can see how dirty the sow is, you can see there's basically nil bedding and what is there is covered in muck and filthy. Um, she's farrowing in quite a large area and the piglets are just going for a, a wander. I think there was a piglet off site that uh, was trying to escape. Piglets are being born into all of that muck and that umbilical cord, when that snaps, that's going to be trailing through all of that muck on the ground. There you go, trailing across that muck. And that's basically um, a, a route of entry for disease into the pig that can then whiz around the body, settle in the joints or cause other health issues. Um, I see very little correct with this video. The only good thing is that actually the piglets themselves look remarkably fit and well but in other respects, I'm not exactly delighted with this. So if we can show the second video, please, Emily. So this video you'll see is the complete opposite of the first video. We have um, a sow farrowing down in a very deep bedded pen looks like it's been bedded on hay, but that, that's not an issue. That sow, it's got a lovely deep bed. We've got uh, somebody behind her catching the piglet, wearing gloves, cleaning the mouth and nostril from the piglet so it's able to breathe easily, and just making sure that that piglet's getting going before letting it go um, and generally doing a very good job. If I'm absolutely honest, I would say that there's probably um, a little bit too much attention here. Um, and this has probably been put on YouTube just to perhaps uh, really demonstrate how good they think they are. The excellent uh, attention, but I would imagine that Sal would have been equally happy with a little less intervention happening there. I can't fault the fact that the sow's very quiet, however, but maybe to my mind, there's no real reason why there needs to be that level of intervention. But certainly of the two videos, I would air you to follow second video approach rather than video one. Next slide, please. So the big question is, we've got a sow farrowing, when would we need to consider helping her? What, what would be cause for concern? So as I mentioned earlier, you would generally not notice a sow straining to give birth. It's the uterus that does most of that activity. So if you're seeing a sow straining and no piglet is being produced, that would certainly ring alarm bells. 
If the interval between piglets being born becomes excessive, again, remember that the piglets uh, first and second born, the interval between those is certainly likely to be 45 minutes to an hour, but thereafter they should come more quickly. And certainly if we're looking at 25, 30 minutes between piglets, particularly if the sow's looking a little distressed, that would give me reason to consider having a surreptitious uh, feel of the sow. As I said before, if the sow's restless actually during the farrowing process, that can be a cause for concern. She's likely to be restless before she commences farrowing, but hopefully once the farrowing process actually starts, she lies down, remains laid down and just continues to pass her eight, 10, 12 piglets, whatever it happens to be. Sometimes you may notice that the little blobs of feces coming out of the back end of a sow, um, and if that's occurring in the absence of a piglet, that can also be an indicator for problems. So one of the last things that any animal does when it's being born, when it's under stress, is pass void its void its feces, um, passes the meconium, the first feces. And that can um, be an indicator that you've got a stressed piglet there that's struggling, and that may warrant uh, a little bit of assistance. Obviously, if the species there, the piglet's likely to be right near the end of the birth canal, so it shouldn't be a problem getting it out if necessary. And one of the last reasons to be concerned is if unfortunately the sow prolapses her entire uterus, the bed that the whole piglet uh, are carried in. That is an absolute veterinary emergency um, and you need to call a vet. Um, unfortunately, the outcome often is poor um, and in 20 odd, nearly 30 years of vetting, I can only recall being asked to attend two or three of these, but unfortunately the outcome was pretty much the same in all instances, either a dead sow by the time I got there or a sow that required euthanasia because of the shock of having prolapsed the uterus. If in doubt, don't hesitate to seek advice from people that you uh, trust and know uh, to be more experienced and or obviously call your vet for advice. We're happy to advise, we don't necessarily have to come and visit, um, but always seek reassurance if you're uncomfortable, un uncomfortable with what's happening. Next slide, please. So this again is a little video. And you can see that this sow again is just struggling to pass this piglet. You can see it's right there. This is probably a guilt giving birth, possibly even to her first piglet. So she's just needing to stretch those vulval lips a little bit and to help pass that piglet. Now, to my mind, she is just having a bit too much effort there. You can see her tail's waggling. You can see she's moving around pop out it comes. I would probably have just helped ease that piglet out if I'd been present there, I must be honest. Um, and But the end result is a nice healthy little piglet. If you look carefully where that slide stopped now, you can see those brown dots over the body of the piglet, just at the vulval lips there, and that's likely to be meconium. Uh, that's been passed by the piglet, the faeces, and that again would be an indicator that that piglet was just getting a little bit stressed. Again, there's probably a, a little section just underneath the folded ear if you look carefully, and that would be an indicator that that piglet potentially didn't have that much longer before it started to really struggle. Next slide, please. So this slide very much says, says what you need to know. If you uh, feel that there's a need to intervene and help your sow guilt farrow down, then the likelihood is that the best way to achieve that is to undertake a careful manual vaginal examination of the sow. And some people will have done this that are listening in the audience today, others won't have. But the key point 
is to just be as careful and as gentle and as hygienic as you possibly can be. So clean the back end of the sow. If you remember back to that first video of the sow firing down, she was filthy. If you were to help her and to insert your hand into that sow, you're just as likely to introduce infection. So make sure she's nice and clean. Just wipe her with some paper toweling or a little bit of um, water with uh, maybe a soft antiseptic. Wear a gloved arm, sorry, wear a glove on your arm and use plenty of lubricant such that you don't uh, introduce infection and are rough and traumatic. And in order to minimize the diameter of your hand when you're inserting it into the sow, form your fingers into a cone shape by bringing them together. And that should enable you to insert your hand into the sow more easily. If you put your hand inside, you're likely to feel a contraction coming uh, towards you. Just let that contraction, that wave of tissue pass over you, and then you can gently insert your hand a little bit further and hopefully feel a little piglet and help remove it. But the key point again, if in doubt, seek help, be it from a colleague, be it from a vet. What you don't want to do is be rough, take no precautions of hygiene, roll your sleeve up and just force your arm inside the sow. That's not going to do any good for the sow, probably little for the piglet. And um, the only good thing is it's likely to hurt you as well. So don't do that. Next slide, please. So if you have managed to uh, decide you need to intervene and help the sow firing, and you've put your arm inside the sow. Question is, what do you reach for? How hard can you pull? Whatever bit of piglet you can feel. And what happens if you can't even feel a piglet? What do you do then? So generally, piglets are born coming out of the sow face first, as you will have seen on a couple of those uh, slides. They tend to be uh, laying in the uterus with their head facing the head of the sow and they come down the uterine horn, effectively do a three point turn at the base of the horn into the uterine body and then come out forward facing. So normally what you'll feel when you put your hand in hopefully is a head of a piglet. And if you can gently put your first two fingers over the head of that piglet so you trap its head in like a v-shaped vice grip with the rest of the head in the cup of your hand you can then normally gently pull that piglet particularly if you've managed to put plenty of lubricants on your arm and in so doing make the internal passageway there uh, more lubricated and easier for the piglet to move sometimes you'll notice piglets being born backwards and that's probably more likely the further through farrowing uh, the sow gets because sometimes those latter born piglets they don't go through that three point turn maneuver um, and that can be an indication sometimes of them becoming slightly oxygen deprived so those piglets may need a little bit of extra attention when they're born to get them going better and it may be an indication that farrowing's progressed for long enough and that the sow may be getting tired how hard can i pull obviously you don't want to just use all your brute strength because if you're having to do that, then there's something drastically wrong. But gentle, firm traction on, an, on the piglet should be absolutely fine, particularly if you've managed to introduce some lubricant. Um, again, if in doubt, don't hesitate to seek assistance. What if you can't feel a piglet? What's the answer? The uterus of the sow is likely to be a lot longer than your arm, particularly older sows. And as a consequence, it may well be that you can't reach anything, in which case uh, remove your arm and perhaps have a check in five to ten minutes. Because sometimes the initial action of you having put your arm in once will encourage a little bit of stimulation and they'll have pushed the piglet down far enough for you to reach. If they really can't, then you may have to seek some veterinary help to get some oxytocin to help encourage the uterine contraction. Next slide, please. 
So again, this is schematic of a sow giving birth um, or needing help. It looks more like she's giving birth to a litter of rabbits than to piglets, I'll accept. But you can see the key points here. The person who's likely to be interfering here is wearing a glove on their hand and they've formed that hand into the cone shape, gently inserting into the sow. And in this instance, the piglet's presented backwards, legs facing forward, a breech presentation. And they can probably just grab the hips gently and again, just gently extract that piglet. Next slide, please. So this is a proper assisting farrowing, as it were. The top picture, you can see that the farrowing person is wearing uh, an arm length glove. What we can't tell is that it's uh, got some lubricant on it so that that's uh, not gonna cause any trauma to the sow. And although the bar's slightly in the way on the photo, you get the impression that that hand is being cupped into a cone shape to try and reduce the diameter of the hand to make internal examination of the sow easier. And then with the second picture, you can see that that arm's going straight in. And in many instances, you could put your arm right up to the shoulder if the piglet's a long way away. So when we would remove a piglet, Normally, we just double check that there's not another problem behind, such that the animal's not injured in any way and that there's a clear, unobstructed canal for the rest of the litter to come through. Okay, next slide, please. So, in order to reduce the risk of farrowing problems, there are a couple of things that we can do because um, that's the aim of the game, not to have to intervene with farrowing in the first place. So one of the biggest problems that we'd run across is if sows are overfit. Now, this is very much a case of do as I say, not as I do, because I will concede that my Aberdeen Angus cattle are probably overfit as well. But uh, as a entity, I would argue that smallholders tend to do their animals rather too well and if anything the problem is that sales tend to be overfit and if they're overfit they're likely to be more problematic at farrowing they can be uh, perhaps lazier slower able to farrow they've got less muscle tone able to deliver the pig if sales are overfed again around farrowing that can be a problem because of what we were saying earlier, if they've got a full gut, they're likely to have farrowing problems. And for the same reason, constipation can be an issue. So if the sows appear constipated with either less feces being produced or it's very dry in texture, then make sure there's plenty of water available to her and maybe even offer a little bit of bran. Hot weather can be a real problem for heavily pregnant sows and during extreme weather conditions um, it's not uncommon for odd sows to die either just before they give birth when their body weight and condition is at its absolute maximum or even during the stress of giving birth itself and that's again where insulated farrowing accommodation could be of benefit in helping to keep internal arc temperatures cooler and sows more comfortable um, if you go around the country and you see outdoor farrowing units you may well have noticed that a lot of arcs are painted white and that's again for the same reason in the summer to help deflect heat and keep the internal temperatures cooler and reduce the stress on the animal. Bedding as we said we want decent bedding which the sow can use as a nest and a flat level bed such that piglets are born but not trapped and lastly we want adrenaline levels of both the sows and yourselves to be nice and low. So if you're not stressed and the sows aren't getting stressed, then the whole process of farrowing goes a lot more smoothly. So by all means observe, but don't unnecessarily interfere with a farrowing sow and try and stop um, lots of other activity around when she's trying to farrow. Okay, next slide please. So we talked about condition, and as a generality, we're looking for a condition score of around three. 
and that's pretty much perfect all year round for all stages of pregnancy lactation. Um, maybe in the summer months, I would tend to err on them being slightly leaner, maybe two and a half, two and three quarters. And in the winter, I'll let them get a bit more cover. So maybe three and a quarter, three and a half. But if you look at your cells, around three is where we are. And the next slide will demonstrate um, how to tell what condition score your cells are in. You can show that, please, Emily. So again, Condition three, you should be able to feel the bones with firm pressure. Um, too easily, she's probably a bit lean, struggling to feel the bones there, and she's probably a bit fit. So three is what you want to be achieving. And if you go out tomorrow and double check the condition of your cells, anything that's in the five category, you want to start thinning back, certainly. Okay, next slide, please. So we've had um, piglets hopefully being born, but we want to make sure that you get them through to weaning without any problems. So we've touched on the fact that piglets can chill and have issues if they're born into a non-hygienic environment. The most important thing is to ensure good colostral intake. This is the first milk that's produced and it's full of energy and full of antibodies to protect them against infection. So good colostrum intake is absolutely key. Obviously pigs are gonna to struggle to rear lots of piglets or more piglets than they have teats, working teats for. So you may need to consider a little bit of cross fostering or helping piglets with a bit of supplementation if required. And certainly as cells age, you can have issues with discrepancy amongst piglets in size. Um, and here it can be helpful to split a litter in half of bigger piglets and smaller piglets and let the piglets that are smaller have unrestricted teat access from their larger siblings so that hopefully they get their fair share. Um, just skipping down that list a bit further, savaging can be an issue with odd gilts attacking their uh, newly born litter. And if you've got litter sisters that are due to farrow down and one of them is savaged, her litter sister is also more likely to savage her piglets than an unrelated guilt would be. So that's just something to bear in mind. Okay, next slide, please. So a couple of things that you'll see here, you've got piglets fighting over a teat, perhaps because the sow's not milking very well. And uh, the bottom slide on the right hand side there shows the size discrepancy then a, that can occur. And that little piglet's more at risk of trying to suckle on the teat for longer when sow is stood up and maybe risks being overlain as a consequence. Okay, next slide, please. Scour, not the prettiest set of pictures, but I don't think any of you are going to mistake this, the fact that those piglets are likely to be poorly if that's coming out of the back end of them. And again, good colostrum, good hygiene are going to be very instrumental in reducing the risks of problems such as that. Next slide, please. So piglets fighting, you'll sometimes see that. Um, and that can be associated with arguments over teat line, maybe a sow not feeling 100% and not milking very well, can be triggered by drafts like we were discussing earlier. Drafts are really prone for causing piglets to get irritated and start to fight. And then of course there's just some natural behavior in pigs. There will be a degree of normal activity rambunctiousness amongst them. But if the sow is struggling to milk and you're seeing that they're fighting a lot, worst case scenario is the picture on the right where they all uh, try and suckle for rather longer than they ought to. The sow lies down and unfortunately they're squashed. I have seen odd instances where fat sows have had piglets suckling the teat lines and then um, the piglets have fallen asleep and it's almost like the piglets have suffocated from the teat line. So just be careful. Next slide, please. So 
Again, health issues in piglets. Fighting will give that infection in the uh, top right hand corner. So that piglet needs some antibiotic treatment. Uh, joint till, bottom left, can be caused by infection getting in through the navel cord or injury. And unfortunately, that's got a serious infection in its hock joint. And the best thing, unfortunately, for that pig is probably to gently put it to sleep. Splay leg, you're unlikely to see, but it can be associated with mouldy feed or mouldy straw, so just be careful. And piglets are quite prone to anemia if they don't get enough iron either you providing iron via uh, powders or an injection or outdoor piglets will often get iron from the soil which helps overcome problems. So piglets we've covered, how do we control health concerns in the sow? As I stated earlier it's normally all to do with good sow condition or correct sow condition and the primary problem we would notice particularly during the summer months would be farrowing fever and that's a combination often of mastitis, metritis which is infection coming out of the back of the sow so that's completely normal to a degree for a sow that's freshly farrowed but if it's purulent or the sow's off colour or it's continuing for three or four days that could well be an indication of a problem and associated with those it's likely to be reduced milk ability so that farring fever or MMA you may hear it being called and both of those will trigger problems with the sow health and lead to health of piglet issues through uh, lack of milk ability of the sow and piglets failing to thrive. Next slide please. So last real slide on the sow side here, and you can just see the picture in front of us on the left there. We've got a sow, possibly a little fit, um, and she's got a purulent vaginal discharge there. So that's something that would warrant treatment. And then the sow on the right, um, I don't think anybody's going to miss the fact that she's got a very swollen uh, udder there with signs of infection and the rest of her udder actually looks slightly purpley as if she's going toxic and although the shadowing of the photo is not ideal I think you can just get an indication that the backbone of the piglets is perhaps coming a little bit more prominent uh, indicating she's probably not milking very well. Next slide please. So that rounds off the part of the talk on farrowing, as I was quickly asked to cover. But the other point that is desperately important is the risk of notifiable disease to pigs. And as a group, unfortunately, smallholders tend to get labelled as a massive risk for introduction of disease, exotic notifiable diseases to the pig industry because people assume, I'm sure quite incorrectly, that you're not feeding the pigs correct. The key point, and I'll leave this to Marcus to go over in more detail, is to not feed any meat or meat products or kitchen scraps in any way, shape or form, because a lot of these viruses are very resilient and can survive the process of um, being cured or being cooked and risk massive risk of health to the pig industry and in diseases like foot and mouth agriculture as a whole next slide please so thank you very much for your attention i hope i've answered some of the queries you may have had um, but any questions that have cropped up during the course of this talk send them forward to Emily and we'll have a chat at the end of the session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Adrian. Um, that was a great overview of the um, farrowing process. So we have got one question, but we will pop that at the end just for time. So we will um, get Marcus going if that's okay. I'll pass over to you then, Marcus. Thank you very much, Emily, and thanks, Adrian. Um, welcome, everybody. We're very lucky to have um, a vet with uh, as much specialist pig experience as uh, as Adrian. Um, 
giving us uh, that kind of uh, presentation. And uh, I'd like to thank him very much for giving up his evening to uh, to share all that information with us. So I'm going to follow on and uh, talk a little bit about exotic disease and um, what we can do to protect ourselves. So exotic disease and breeds at risk. If I could have the first slide. So what's the threat? Well, we've just heard one of the big threats at the moment is African swine fever. And uh, here are some quite chilling statements from uh, people who know a thing about or two. Um, Vice President of the OIE saying that we could lose a quarter of the world's pig population. And uh, Chris Netherton at the bottom there is the senior researcher the, leading the team at Purbright who are trying to develop the vaccine. And um, as he says, it's the biggest challenge we've faced uh, for more than 100 years. You may have seen uh, some news stories earlier in the year about uh, progress on a vaccine. It is progress in that it's progress down the path that we were hoping to follow. It wasn't some new breakthrough. It was just confirmation that what they've been working on is, uh, has started to, uh, started to go in the right direction. But we're still years away from having a vaccine, and there's no doubt that um, the current situation is only going to uh, delay that. So we've got to deal with it in some other way. It's no good hoping for a vaccine. Can I have the next slide? So where is it? Well, it's um, all over Europe, as you can see. Uh, these purple dots are wild boar uh, cases. So Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Poland, up into the Baltic states. And uh, the red dots are commercial pig units. You can see it's got down into Greece, um, into uh, Serbia. Uh, it's recently jumped across in Poland onto the border of Germany, which is very worrying for them. And also that outlier there in Luxembourg and jumped uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles. So it's a very dangerous disease that uh, can spread across very large areas. And if you have the next slide, please. We need to not rely on that 22 miles of water between us and the coast of France. That's not going to save us. This is the uh, picture in Asia just this year. This is January to June this year. You can see that the disease is still rampant in China, in uh, Korea. It's made its way into India and Myanmar. But look at the Philippines, the uh, big red area in the center of the northern Philippines. That's two or three hours flight from, the, uh, uh, from mainland Asia. And then you look down to the bottom to Papua New Guinea, and then uh, and across to East Timor, these are huge distances that the disease is traveling. So 22 miles is not going to save us. And if I could have the next slide, please. And it's not just about African swine fever. The, Japan has a problem at the moment with classical swine fever. The purple dots are wild boar outbreaks um, on the main island. But unfortunately, that little red dot down at the bottom, that's uh, how the disease, the classic, uh, classical swine fever, has jumped all the way to Okinawa. Uh, that's more than two hours flying from Tokyo. It's uh, nearer to Taiwan than it is to Japan. The, again, huge jumps. So we've got to be very, very vigilant about uh, keeping these diseases out from our pigs. So can I have the next slide? So what would we do? What have we, what have we prepared ourselves? What sort of contingency planning have we got? Contingency planning has been a big feature of uh, discussions about the situation we find ourselves in with the pandemic. What have, what have we got in the way of contingency planning for exotic uh, animal disease? Well, we have a plan. Uh, this is the government's plan published and updated in November and it deals with all the notifiable diseases, foot and mouth, classical swine fever, African swine fever. And if I could have the next slide. So within that plan, there is a section on what's called breeds at risk policy. So what is it? What does it mean? Well, essentially, it's a policy that allows for special arrangements 
for breeds at risk to be considered for sparing from culling if they don't have the disease in the event of a massive outbreak where we're trying to stamp out the disease and there's a risk that we might lose our rare breeds. And the breeds that are eligible for that are on the UK breeds at risk list, which is maintained by you know, this Farm Animal Genetic Resources Committee. So all of our native breeds, uh, native pig breeds are on that list. Does that mean they're all safe? Unfortunately not. It doesn't uh, mean that at all. It just means that uh, you've got a seat at the table. But all the decisions that will be made about sparing any animals from culling will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. And the way it works is that a vet comes to your farm. If they think there's an investigation to be carried out, they'll ask you if you have any uh, breeds that are on the list. If you say yes, and you have got the animals because they'll be able to check um, who's got what, then they'll carry out this uh, veterinary risk assessment. And that will be a case of them asking a lot of questions and looking at a lot of records and deciding whether or not it's safe to recommend to the chief vet, because every single one of these has to be approved at the highest level. So then they'll pass this up to the CBO to say, we think this is um, a safe decision to make. And that will be a very difficult decision for a vet to make that recommendation in the middle of an outbreak. So it won't be an easy thing for them to recommend. So what do we need to do? Well, the plan itself, these, are all, uh, these statements are all taken from that document. And it says very clearly, it's important that the keepers of the animals have contingency plans themselves and measures in place in case of an exotic disease outbreak. And the committee has actually produced some guidelines on contingency planning, which we'll come on to in a minute. But I'd also like to show you what the British Pig Association have been doing in terms of our contingency planning with our breeders in order to prepare ourselves to do our, take our responsibility for this. It's not just the government's responsibility, it's our responsibility as breeders to make sure that we're prepared. So if I could have the next slide. We talked about this uh, breeds at risk list and uh, what you have to do to be on it. Well, the threshold for pigs is 1,500 sows. And you can see there over the last 20 years, the only breed that's ever got over that level is the Gloucestershire Old Spots. Most of them stay below it all the time. And it would be easy to think, well, the simple answer is we just need more sows and then everything will be fine. But that's a very difficult thing to achieve. You can see here that over time, breeds go up and then they come down again. There's uh, spikes in popularity. If you look at the black line along the bottom, that's the large blacks. And you can see that population stays relatively stable all the way through. So what we need to do is come up with contingency planning and uh, uh, programs that assume that we're going to have this minimum population and not just think, oh, well, if we get a lot of uh, increase the population, everything will be fine. So if I could have the next slide. So some of you may have seen this uh, in uh, Practical Pigs magazine or uh, on the new BPA website in the conservation section. Each of our native breeds has a plan like this. And what we're trying to do is not just look at the number of sows or even uh, the number in the lines, but look at where they are, because we need to have them distributed around the country to give them a better chance of being safe. If we have a disease, the chances are it'll be uh, more in one area than another. And this map shows that for the large blacks, for example, most of the population is in the southwest and in East Anglia. And what we need to do is even that distribution out so that we've got the sows and all the lines, both within the sows and the boars, spread out across, uh, across the country as much as possible so that if we've got a big outbreak in the southwest, at least we've got most of the pigs maybe in Wales or in the, the north of the country, the same, uh, the same lines preserved in those other areas. 
and that works fine for the on-farm conservation. You've got uh, sows and boars there, the, the live animals. But the second part and very important part of uh, contingency planning, because if we have a big disease outbreak, some pigs will get culled. And we need to then rebuild the population, not just the population, but the diversity within that population. And so what we need is a gene bank. So on the next slide, and this is the result of uh, almost 20 years work between the BPA and the RBST. I apologize for forgetting to put the RBST's logo on, but this is a a joint project between the BPA and the RBST that's been running since 2002. Basically, in the aftermath of foot and mouth disease, we realized that we hadn't got any protection and we needed to put something in place. And the plan that we have is to have 10, a minimum of 10 boars from each of the breeds, but also cover all of the lines, the boar lines within the breed, and some breeds have more than 10 lines. So, so far we've managed to collect 90 boars. We've got about 6,000 straws frozen in liquid nitrogen, but we've still got another 20 boars that we need to collect. I suppose all in all between us, the BPA and the RBST have invested well over a quarter of a million pounds in this project, maybe more if you take into account all the time and uh, effort that's gone into it. So these are all things that that where we have made some progress, where we could say, well, we're better off now than we were in 2002, but we've still got a lot of work to do. But the next slide, which is this contingency plan, is something that we really need to get started on. We haven't done nearly enough work on this. So what this, this guide, which is online, and I'll uh, show you the link to where you can find it, talks about what you would need to do to be able to pass that veterinary risk assessment. So if I could have the next slide. And there's a lot in it, so I don't in any way propose to go through all of this this evening. I'm hoping that we can have sessions on this uh, all around the country, either face-to-face -face or more meetings like this, to work out how we can uh, set up farms that would have a chance of passing this kind of risk assessment and that we can actually test them with the local uh, veterinary authorities from APHA and uh, uh, show that we've uh, got some contingencies in place. But there's a lot in there and a lot that you would need to do and you'd need to have a track record. So it'd be no good thinking that, well, on the day, well, I've got some rare breed pigs and so I'll be all right. You'll need to have a lot more than that. We all will. And so this is something that we really, really need to focus on over the next few years, because if we don't have this in place, that breeds at risk policy, it, it'll just be a policy. It won't be possible to implement it because it can only be implemented if we do our side of the bargain, which is put these plans in place. But in the meantime, there's something else that we can do, which is even more important and that's keep the disease out. And if I could have the next slide. As Adrian said, we are the ones, we are the first line of defense. We, the people keeping the pigs, are the first line of defense. If we don't allow meat and meat byproducts and kitchen scraps and illegal feeding of our pigs, and that doesn't just mean what what people might be feeding themselves. I'm sure that most of you will be absolutely aware that you're not allowed to, uh, uh, to feed kitchen waste and meat to your pigs. But of course, the pandemic has brought lots and lots of people out walking in the countryside who've uh, suddenly found they've got a lot more time and uh, going up country lanes and so on. Don't let them think that, for, that they're doing a good thing by feeding your pigs. Make sure you've got signs. If you're anywhere near a footpath, make sure you've got signs there saying, do not feed my pigs. You can get the signs free of charge from AHDB, go on their website, you can order them and they'll send them to you. But whatever you do, make sure that we are keeping the disease out. So that's been a bit of a quick run through, um, but um, I do, and like I say, I'm very much hoping that we can uh, run through uh, all of those plans and programs in a bit more detail with some uh, more meetings like this.
So thank you very much indeed, and I'll be happy to take any questions now or later on. Oh, I think I've skipped a, skipped a slide there. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, thank you ever so much, Marcus, um, for that rundown on the, um, although be it very quickly, um, on the diseases um, and the breeds at risk. Um, so I have got a couple of questions. Um, I've had a couple of people raise their hands throughout. So if you can um, just go, if you are looking to ask a question, press on the um, red arrow to pop your control panel out um, and go go down to the questions um, and type them in there and send them in and that'd be great um, and then I've got a couple for Adrian here um, mostly around temperature um, so how critical is temperature when winter and in brackets January firing please and then another one is what range of temperature is expected in firing arcs and what temperature should ring alarm bells? Okay. Um, winter, I, I don't particularly view winter as, as a great problem. Um, it provided that the accommodation that you're firing your sows in is um, draft proofed and is the opening is faced away from the prevailing wind and hopefully um, snow and such like, then it's a case of utilizing more straw within the ark such that the sows can make a good bed to keep themselves warm within and hopefully uh, piglets will stay out of harm's way and will thrive. So winter, to be honest, is rarely the issue. Um, and if you look at outdoor pigs uh, during the winter, often they're absolutely thriving. It's not much of a problem. And internal temperatures in that instance, those arcs are often a heck of a lot warmer than the ambient temperature is. So often up in the high teens in temperatures. In the summer, um, the question really is, I suppose, are the sows showing signs of stress so ways to mitigate that risk are to try and position your farrowing accommodation such that you can get any available uh, through drafts going through it so open up the the backs um, consider provision of wallows for the sows such that they can go and lie into wallows and get a good covering of sunscreen effectively such that they can uh, control their temperatures rather better that way because they can only really control temperatures from evaporative loss they're not like us they don't sweat so that that will work quite nicely as far as range of temperatures is concerned then as you saw from the picture from the infrared camera the internal temperature of that arc was at 25 degrees and that would be absolutely fine um, as a general rule in order to uh, keep sows and piglets in good health i would like temperatures to be somewhere between 18 and 24 degrees for the most part um, a little warmer obviously for the piglets is tucked down into the straw such that um, there may be a few degrees warmer than that um, five ten degrees warmer even if you were farrowing indoors you'd probably farrow down temperature of about 22 23 degrees and then once everything's farrowed you'd probably drop the room temperature to about 18 degrees and that does two things. One, it improves the appetite of the sows. Two, it reduces the risk of heat stress. And actually a third thing is you'll probably be providing a specialist creep area for the piglets and they will move away from the sow onto their creep mat at middle 30s, high 30s degrees C. So they'll stay in a safe zone away from being squashed. And the closer you can match that with outdoor farrowing, the better really. Lovely, thank you. 
Okay, I've got one from Marcus here. Um, would the BPA make any herd ASF secure, e.g. a safe herd with the most at-risk lines not near any other herds? So that's, that would be the plan. What I, what I would like to see is um, in each of those regions that we have are herds where we've got a reasonable spread of the, of the lines and the genetics in herds that we've tested with the local animal health office and say this is one of the herds that we would be proposing to, uh, to put into quarantine. There'd be lots of things we'd have to look at. We'd have to fundraise to pay for feeding and so on, because if the herd's locked up, you're not selling anything. You know, who's going to pay for the food? So there's a lot of a lot of other things to be overcome, but I'm sure that we could overcome that. But that is where we need to finish up. To be safe, we need to have herds for each of those breeds around the country with good representations of the lines, fantastic biosecurity that's been tested, and then hopefully uh, a gene bank that's uh, that's got all the bores and bore lines in it. And that doesn't mean that we can then be complacent, but it puts us in a much better position than we were in uh, 2001, when we went into foot and mouth really with uh, no defences at all. We didn't even have that policy at, at that time for sparing or any of those things. But the first line of defence, like I said, is keep the disease out. That's the first line. But the second line, the contingency, must be to set up these farms. And that's what I'd like to be talking to people about over the next uh, next year or so, how we achieve that. Lovely. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I've, if I go with um, another couple of short questions and then um, we'll wrap up and I will get back to um, people that have got the bigger questions um, sort of privately afterwards. Um, so I've got one. Could you quickly run through the, the physical signs of ASF? So I'm not sure if that would be Adrian or Marcus. Potentially Adrian. <laughs> um, so ASF, um, typically you would see or we get taught that you get high levels of mortality, but that is not necessarily so. So it can just be that the animals are running a fever. If they're in pig, you might see abortions. You will get um, maybe some uh, rashing on the skin surface. You can get um, enlarged lymph nodes, which are hemorrhagic. If you have a dead animal and you open it up, all of these signs would certainly make you concerned that African swine fever is present. And legally, if you think that that may be a problem, uh, you have to notify um, DEFRA, or uh, certainly you talk to your local vet, and if the vet is concerned, they have to legally notify DEFRA, because this isn't a disease that we muck about with, none of the notifiables are. So we would have to get a government vet to come and review it as well, and they place movement restrictions on the farm and in the area and uh, look at uh, the situation over a little while to see what develops. But signs are not always as serious as we're led to believe. So temperature, bit of rashing, lethargy, uh, signs like that. But And again, probably knowledge that those animals have managed to access feed that they shouldn't have either through direct access from uh, somebody stupidly feeding them or a flying sandwich from a footpath, as uh, Marcus has stated. So we do need to try and stop it getting in rather, uh, as well as worrying about what it does. Lovely, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, it seems like a very blunt um, yes or no question, this one. So um, teeth clipping for larger li litters, yes or no? Mm -hmm. um, 
so teeth teeth clipping or increasingly teeth grinding where you just take the very tips of the uh, sharp piglet teeth off uh, can be undertaken um, what we tend to do is probably monitor the litters on an individual basis because um, teeth clipping is not allowed as a routine policy it would be deemed an unnecessary mutilation so we would look at the litters on an individual basis if they're very large the cells haven't got enough teats to cope with them and we need to uh, cross foster but we haven't got cells to cross foster onto in the short term and piglets are fighting and causing injury to one another then in those instances potentially so but if I was firing down a sow with eight to 10, 12 piglets, I would try hard to avoid teeth clipping, certainly. Oh, it's helped if I uh, unmute myself, sorry about that. Um, so we, we, we are able to go um, continue with um, some questions. So I have one here for, Marcus, um, any thoughts on the growing cases of swine flu emerging in the east? Swine flu, if we're talking about swine influenza, then uh, I think the reports in the press about uh, about um, influ swine influenza or in China. Um, the, the World Health Organization, every six months, they record all of the new strains of influenza and then they decide which, are, uh, which ones need to be incorporated into the ongoing vaccination program because they know these things mutate all the time. So there will always be new strains emerging and uh, don't think we should um, uh, be alarmist about a particular one just because uh, it has some association with pigs. You know, you're, the rules are quite clear that if you ha if you have influenza, you shouldn't be going and uh, and dealing with your animals. We know that it's possible that uh, these things can interact, but um, I'm not overly concerned about uh, about that. I believe that. Um, um, the, the world, you know, the uh, the World Health Organization has has that monitoring program under control, and that um, they'll uh, they'll be able to uh, look into that uh, particular case. I'm, to be honest with you, I'm a lot more concerned about uh, about African swine fever, and uh, and obviously the situation we've got with uh, with the coronavirus. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so I have one here for Adrian. In our last litter of piglets, um, they were only suckling for a couple of minutes and the sow became restless and then got up. Um, I guess it sort of links to this, the next question. It says, um, how long will the piglets have to get enough colostrum? So um, is, is that a problem, essentially, that she became restless and got up so quickly, I, I guess? OK, so um, piglets will tend to suckle approximately every hour or so. Um, and the colostrum from the sow is being produced or is, is there at its very best quality in the teat lines at the timing of farrowing. So the earlier the piglets can access that, the better. Um, there's then a change in the gut lining, which means that they start to struggle to absorb some of the antibodies with time. But if they can get two or three halfway decent suckles within the first six to eight hours, then hopefully they'll be absolutely fine. Lovely. Hope that answered that one. Um, okay, this one's quite a big one. 
So, um, I'm new to breeding pigs and surprised at the water containers often used by other pig breeders as the water is dirty. Is this an issue or concern? Personally, I would have bought a revolving water feeder or one that has a plug um, so it can be emptied and cleaned seems better. What are the gu guidelines? Um, there, there are guidelines uh, for farms which are red tractor assured, which relate to um, total levels of bacteria within the water system and also um, specifically coliforms like E. coli. And that's geared towards um, units which are maybe using borehole or spring water rather than mains because the chlorine, uh, chloramine within the mains water should hopefully keep pathogen levels very, very low. I would agree it makes perfect sense to ensure that the water receptacle that you're using and the quality of the water within it is as good as it possibly can be. Essentially, my question would be, would you drink the water out of that container? If not, why should you expect your pig to? Now, arguably, it's more important for young pigs and young wieners where they perhaps struggle to control the pH of their gut so much. So anything that they take in that could be potentially pathogenic can cause them mischief and things that I would be concerned by would maybe be drinkers where, for example, birds were messing in them. So starlings, seagulls, animals like that, that mess into water containers that pigs will drink from, that's a good route of disease spread. So good hygiene is absolutely key and I would completely support anybody who uh, improve the hygiene of their water system. Yeah, here, here. Lovely, thank you. Um, so I've got the last question I've got here um, is in one of our farrowings, our sow, and I gather this was meant to say wasn't. Um, our sow wasn't in milk for more than over 24 hours. How long over is acceptable? Sorry, Emily, can you just read that out again? Um, so it says, in one of our farrowings, our sow was in milk for more than 24 hours. So, but I think that may be wasn't in milk. It so might be was, was in milk prior to farrowing. If it was she had milk present for more than 24 hours prior to farrowing, is that a problem? Um, obviously, if she's dripping milk, or there's, um, then some of that best quality milk, the colostrum there, is being lost, and it's not ideal, but um, there's not a lot you can do about it. So I'm afraid all you can really do is when that sow farrows down, do your level best to make sure that the piglets get a good suckle of whatever colostrum is there and hopefully again they will be fine. If it was the fact that the sow appeared to stop milking 24 hours after farrowing then obviously that's a bit of a disaster and those piglets without supplementation with artificial milk or cross fostering onto another sow will essentially starve to death. So that those are the two potential scenarios from that question. And if the sow was 24 hours and then dried up, then there was probably a health issue uh, or a feeding issue that triggered that problem. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. Um, and then one last comment, and I think it's um, quite a um, cool one, is um, that, Somebody's thanked us for our presentation and is sending greetings from Mexico. It's one of our um, one of our other speakers, so that's very nice to know. It's well received over there. Um, so we are going to have to finish up now due to time um, constraints. And as so far, we've got through all our questions. Um, as you can see, next steps. If you do have any further questions for the speakers, um, then pop them over to me um, on my email there or give me a call 
um, and I can I can pass them on over to them. Um, Marcus, you can reach through his um, through the BPA website, which is under the um, visit tab there, um, and that's, you can also find the recording for this webinar on the small scale pig keeping page and the event archive. Um, on the small scale pig keeping page, you can also find our new pig keepers guide, um, and you can also order any signs that you may need there as well. Um, and then the last um, part is on the survey. So your feedback is really, really important to us. Um, that goes for um, sort of suggestions for topics as well. So again, send them over to me or you can pop them in your feedback form. Um, and the link for this recording will be with you within 24 to 48 hours. So um, that is that is all from us. So thank you again um, to our speakers for giving up their time this evening. And um, thank you ever so much for um, tuning in. And we'll yep. hopefully see you again. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you this evening and hope that we'll soon be able to meet uh, face to face as we used to. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yes, and everybody take care.